Okay, before we uh, ask our earlier speakers to come back and join us here, um, we're going to hear from uh, Dr. Sarah Piers. Uh, Sarah is uh, Vice President and Trustee of the Women's Engineering Society. So, Sarah, please come and join us. Hello, can you hear me? Great, okay, I'll press the right button on this then. Thank you, okay. Um, thank you very much for uh, having me here today. Um, what I'm going to talk about is some, somewhat of a personal view on this, but also uh, reflecting some of the thinking going on at the Women's Engineering Society. Um, noted lots of information today, including um, things like the government target around 20% for BAME, but no equivalent general target for women and in, for gen, in general. And I'm going to explain this in a little bit in, in much more detail because, of course, the issue for women is around STEM apprenticeships, not for apprenticeships in general. Um, I'm very, very pleased to hear the noises about part-time apprenticeships because, yes, although in theory they're available, in practice they're not. Um, so a little bit about me. I'm a, I'm a trustee, which means I'm a volunteer with the Women's Engineering Society. Um, my day job actually involves a lot of work with Ethi Colleges through uh, the STEM Foundation um, and uh, looking at their approach to STEM. So uh, let's see if I can work this. Here we go. What's the Women's Engineering Society? Um, well, we started in 1919, so we're almost 100 years old. And it's a membership society with only two things in common. We're all women and we're all engineers. Well, no, not quite. We're actually much more diverse than that. Men are encouraged to join, to support the cause, and also um, many of our members are not just engineers. They might have come from applied scientists, they're digital technologists. Uh, sometimes they're people, managers, who are working with a lot of engineers. Um, we count amongst our members people like uh, Amy Johnson, uh, people like uh, Maggie Adarin Pocock, um, we have uh, many women who have been inspiring, pioneering women, but also many ordinary women who just want to work in technical roles. You might also know of us indirectly through what was the National um, Women in Engineering Day, but is now the International Women in Engineering Day. It's celebrated on the 23rd of June because that was the date in 1919 when the first meeting of the women, uh, Women's Engineering Society was convened. So I want to talk about the state of gender a little bit to set the scene. Uh, well, where to start? Uh, the Women's Engineering Society has traditionally focused on professional engineers. So, um, but aside from that, we're also really aware of the STEM issue in general. So women make up the minority of STEM professionals and technicians and craftspeople. Uh, I think the fourth piece of data down there, less than approximately 6% of the engineering workforce are women. But then you look at apprentices and it drops considerably. And you can compare it. I'm glad that, um, sorry, Graham earlier talked about Thailand and women on construction sites in Thailand because I often at uh, FE colleges I'm told, well, this is a global issue, isn't it? Well, no, it's not. So if you look at India, engineering has a very different status and that means that a lot of women go into engineering degrees. And the UK is actually in the bottom of the EU league when it comes to engineering professionals. Uh, there's no corresponding data that I'm aware of for apprentices and technical levels and so on. And sometimes people say, but of course it's getting better. But I think you made the point about 30 years of we're still struggling with uh, gender stereotypes and so on. Um, those are the figures not going up from 2007 to 2014 of women uh, in professional engineering, we don't have similar figures for technical levels, etc. But they're not going up. In fact, when people ask me when do they go up, it's when the law changes that there have been changes. Uh, latest pipeline of figures from uh, the WISE campaign, which was a spin-off from, from WES. And this shows what happens for girls and for boys. I mean, it's shocking enough that only 24% of boys actually go into STEM generally. But look at girls, and it's 7%. 
And that really is shocking when we compare it with global figures around STEM. So if I take one figure out of uh, the ether, 80% of kids in Japan continue studying maths up to the age of 18. Here in the UK, it's 20%. Uh, and what about apprenticeships? Well, apprenticeships are really horrifying. This is uh, the number of, or the uh, proportions of women in engineering apprenticeships. 38, sorry, 3.8% to 4% or thereabouts. And it's not huge changes. In fact, it's dropped a little bit from uh, a couple of years ago, actually. So the figures, actually, that'll actually drop, that little red bar drops a little bit. In other areas, however, Oh, plumbing is horrendous. One in 73 plumbing apprentices are women. But then you have some other not so bad um, percentages. In childcare, however, 94% are women. There's something horribly wrong about this, I think. It reflects something not particularly nice about our society. Uh, vocational pathways is actually very much ignored by most of policy makers are only just beginning to think about it because of apprenticeships. But this is what it looks like for BTECs. In foundation degrees, however, because it starts to look professional, it starts to go up a little bit. The Richards Report, however, had a huge influence on how we viewed apprenticeships and the future for apprenticeships. But when you looked at gender in there, There's not a single mention of gender, not a single mention of diversity. And aside from that, um, actually, di diversity reporting is not brilliant, to be honest. So if we um, look at what is actually required, Ofsted does require EDI reporting. Uh, I'm also a governor at a FE college, and I often ask, so can you break down some of these figures? Because you see 50% or 52% of apprentices are women, you know, 50% are male, etc. Can you break it down a little bit? Because I know when I go into your hair and, dress, uh, hair and beauty uh, classes, they're all women. When I go into the bricklaying, they're all men. Can we break it down? Because that's not made transparent. And that's why it looks okay to people outside. Uh, the, I found one post note, a post note is a sort of four pager that um, the Parliamentary Office for Science and Technology produces for uh, politicians so that they can quickly catch up on some of the issues of the day. And there's one on apprenticeships. And it just says 50% are women, 50% are men. Hey! <laughs> um, I noticed the Diversity Champions uh, Toolkit, which is excellent, by the way, if nobody has seen it, you should do, but never mentions gender. It does talk about BAME. Because government has set that as a, as a target. Um, anecdotally, we get horrifying stories. So these are a couple of stories. Okay. I, can, I actually met a Sparky recently and, and spent some time talking to her. She was a, an alpha female. I know this because I was on a trekking holiday with her. And she was way ahead of everybody else and not suffering a thing of, you know, where the rest of us were suffering and, and needing, uh, you know, lots of blister packs and so on. She wasn't. And amongst a lot of effing and blinding, she told me her story. And the fact that she was actually really upset about something that had happened to her to, at work and that, you know what, she was just now fed up with the guys, and she was leaving. Now, if somebody like that, who was a true alpha female, ahead of the pack everywhere, thinks that she has not got a place on the construction site, she has not got a place in that sector, then God knows what happens to the rest of us. Well, why does any of this really matter? I mean, after all, as long as we have enough, well, enough people, do we have enough people? We don't. Okay, so we've got a horrific skills gap in STEM in the UK. Not just in STEM sectors, but also in non-STEM sectors. In fact, one in six non-STEM jobs require STEM. Okay. But that graph tells you um, the um, green, or the lightish green the, uh, at the top is for 2015. And that's the, the skills gaps. The, 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 this is companies saying to the CBI, to the IET, to various other organizations, EEF, 
look, we just don't have enough people. And not only that, there are companies reporting that they can't grow, that they can't take on projects. Now, here we are in the UK, wondering about standing alone globally. How can we do this if companies are saying, we can't do this work? In the UK, we're currently fishing out of half of the ocean for talent. And even when I look at the industrial strategy and we try to feed this into the industrial strategy, and the industrial strategy actually does more than just say, let's be strong industry. We're also talking about place in terms of let's deal with social mobility and some, some of the regional issues around poverty. But it doesn't talk about people, and you need to talk about people if you're going to talk about social mobility and making a real difference in the region. Because if you've got a region which is all about STEM, for instance, I, I live in Cumbria, so of course the west of uh, Cumbria with nuclear is um, heavily STEM oriented. Now, most women take no part in that sector. So 50% of the population there are in poverty. Other gaps, so not just the skills gap, however. Um, there's the gender pay gap, which is currently around 19%. Every now and again, they, they sort of, there's another survey and something else comes about, up, but it sort of goes back to 90%. Uh, one of the reasons why we have that gender pay gap it is reported is to do with some of the roles and jobs that women choose. And I use quote marks because I'm not sure that we choose them. I think that's where we end up. <laughs> okay. But more than that, even when you look at apprentices, in fact, women tend to be underpaid compared to men. Again, that's partly to do with the types of apprentice uh, roles and, and sectors they go into. Okay. More than that, at the end of their training, Male sectors tend to have better pay as time goes on, while feminized sectors, care, social care, and so on, your salary will stay the same. So it just doesn't grow. There's an opportunity gap as well. Where are the global opportunities? It's actually in the technical levels of STEM. Okay, it's in construction, in technology, in engineering. This is a figure I often use when I'm talking to kids, which is, you know, 94,000, this was in um, 2014, I think, 94,000 people, let's not say women, but they are 95, 96% women, actually completed hair and beauty courses for only 18,000 jobs, new jobs. However, in the construction area, uh, desperate for people, it's only 40,000 boys, were uh, completed their training to fill a huge number of jobs. They just fall into jobs. Women don't. And women enjoy technical roles, and that's to, to prove it. Uh, this lady here, Helen, and I can't remember her name, 1983, the first bus mechanic <laughs> for London Transport. Um, but yes, in surveys, women who manage to stay on course enjoy their work, and they're there because they enjoy their work. Um, there's also something called diversity's dividend, and um, uh, corporates will be very well aware of this. So McKinsey and Dow Jones have done a lot of work around leadership, but also around the proportion of women in companies. So if you've got a company with high diversity, they tend to outperform companies without that diversity. By 15%, the likelihood of outperforming financially, this is hard money. We're not talking nice to have, we're talking money here. It's even better if you're diverse throughout, okay? And Dow Jones did some excellent work around technology companies and said actually with new companies, if they were operated, so the dark, uh, it's, it's green on my screen, but on <laughs> there is dark gray. The dark gray towards the left represents uh, companies that are, um, uh, so this is for this chart over here, this is, Technology companies, digital technology companies, operated by women. Very low cost compared to those that are operated mainly by men. Um, and uh, where you have low women, they tend to fail. When you have lots of women, they tend to succeed. Now, this is not necessarily because women are better than men. <laughs> or BAME are better than, than, than the white. It's to do with actually how those companies think. 
and the fact that diversity is actually linked to creativity and innovation. There are many other reasons um, globally for women to take part fully in work. Um, $28 trillion if uh, we actually have this women working at the same rate as men. What else? What should be do, done? Well, actually, it's a, it's a, it's a very um, leaky pipeline throughout. It's not just in training that we, drop, we lose women. It's not just into STEM, but it's actually throughout their career. And we need intelligent processes and policies across all of these areas, not just entry, but also what happens um, uh, with, while, while working and what happens um, uh, by managers. And we talked a lot about unconscious bias, but there's also something called organizational stupidity. And, and I'll mention that in a moment as well. Because we need to get the environment and culture right for women, but not just for women. Um, what can we do? Well, we can learn from others. So when people say to me, oh, well, you know, it's like this all over the, the, the country. Well, MBDA missile systems manages to have over 50% of their technical apprentices who are women. You can find out why more from talking to them, and maybe companies should be. Sellafield has made huge inroads in changing perceptions around the nuclear industry and engineering, and that's had an impact on the number of women apprentices, technical apprentices that they've had. Rolls-Royce has gone straight in and said, we've got to educate our colleagues to make, understand, to make sure that they understand what the issues are. And one sector, the transport sector, has made a huge, huge difference. So they have actually set a target of 20%. I don't hear it from other sectors, even though... Construction sector talks about image and perceptions, and even though they're desperate for skills, they haven't set any target at all, any ambitions at all on this. Um, whereas we're celebrating 100 years, one of the things we do is mentoring. Uh, we're also setting up a program as part of our centenary celebrations to recognize 100 companies who have made a difference. It's not just about recognizing them and giving nice awards. We're going to end up with at least 100 case studies of how to get it right that we can share. And we're also asking people to make, uh, organizations to make pledges about how they're going to achieve 30% by 2030. We want to stretch people and challenge you to make a difference. The other thing you can do is challenge career choices. Um, girls at school, still in the 21st century, get told first about nursing, then they get told about uh, teaching, and then they get told, if they're clever, about medicine. Those are the top three career choices that girls get told. This is a City and Guild survey. Boys get told about finance, about IT, and engineering. By the way, that character, does anybody recognize it? There's no gaming people here. <laughs> With young people, there's, there's an immediate recognition. That is the engineer from Team Fortress 2, <laughs> an online first-person shooter game. And sadly, when you put in Google engineer, he appears, <laughs> complete with machine gun. That's your perceptions of engineering and technical work, if you like. Um, when it comes to apprenticeships, only 17% of girls get told about apprenticeships versus a third of boys. Now, I think that should be 95% on both sides. And actually, you need to make a difference individually. Data is really important. Challenge around colleagues and stupid processes. Be aware of your own biases. I, th I think uh, the, 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 the comments already made is quite interesting. Positive action, that's not <coughs> positive discrimination, it's positive action to reach targets, to make a change. And include the men. Make sure it's not just women who need to be involved in these conversations. Male colleagues need to be involved. Um, I mentioned stupid processes. I, I, I don't know if anybody recognized this over here. At all. Does anybody recognize what that might be? It looks sort of like coding, doesn't it? Um, in recruitment, often um, STEM companies, particularly when you're talking to your teenagers, will ask things like, well, what do you do in your spare time? And they'll say things like, oh, tinker in the garage. Oh, great, you could be a technical person. You tinker in the garage. Now, unfortunately, a lot of girls aren't encouraged to tinker in the gar garage. However, a lot of girls are t encouraged to tinker with other crafts. That happens to be knitting code. Now, I defy you. If you can think like that, doesn't that make you a great technologist? Somebody can think really logically. How many recruiters and employers think about that? So something around how we recruit starts to filter out people. 
I see gender and the gender issue as a tip of the iceberg because women make up 50% of the population. If you can't see 50% of the population in your classroom, in your workforce, then what else are you hiding in terms of lack of diversity? STEM jobs are also a route to social mobility. We know that. Get paid better. You've got many more opportunities. If women can't take part in that, women are not socially mobile. And your daughters are missing out. So it really does matter that we do something about this. Finally, last thing, action that you should take is all join WEARS. Thank you very much. Think Apprenticeship. Think Pathway.